If you're considering getting into astronomy or astrophotography and is looking to buy your first telescope, then you're in the right place. Today, I'm going to walk you through everything you need to know to buy your first telescope. I'm not going to give you concrete recommendations, say go buy that, go buy this. I'm going to give you the knowledge you need to make up the decision to buy the scope that fits your exact needs. Now the first thing you need to consider when you go out and buy your first telescope is what type of telescope do you want? Each type has some benefits and some drawbacks depending on your situation. The first type of telescope is what's called the refractor. This is basically just a lens, camera lens. It's a telescope that uses lenses, glass lenses to gain its magnification. Now this is quite a common setup for cameras and other stuff like that. But when it comes to telescopes, you can get into situations where you get what's called color fringing, where colors at the edges of especially brighter objects can get um, misaligned and get smeared out a bit. And so the picture doesn't look as sharp when you are looking at very bright objects. Now you can get telescopes, refractor telescopes that have like, correcting lenses in them. But again, glass is expensive, so that does increase the price. And because glass is expensive and it gets exponentially more expensive the bigger the lens is, because it also needs to get thicker the larger the diameter of the lens is, that also means that if you want large aperture, that means large openings at the front of the telescope, these type of telescopes can get heavy um, and also very, very expensive. It's rare that you see refracted telescopes much more than six inches in, in aperture but if you are willing to fork over the cash for a good refractor telescope this is the type of telescope that's going to outlast not you but also your kids these things can be if well maintained can just last forever and it can be an amazing scope but again you do pay the price if you want it quality the second type of telescope is called reflectors where refractors use the used lenses reflectors uses mirrors these type of telescopes will often be constructed of a relatively large optical tube with a big main mirror at the, uh, at the back of the scope that will then send the light up, light up to a um, secondary mirror at the front and then depending on the design it will send the light out um, through the side. The main benefit of reflectors is that they are cheaper, you get more aperture and they are lighter. Because the mirrors doesn't have to be super thick as we have with the lenses, it means you can make them um, a lot lighter and mirrors are just cheaper to make than precision lenses. So again, that uh, takes down price. And again, because we can keep it lighter also means we can make them bigger, it means you get more aperture, collect more light, you can see fainter objects. So these are really your value for money scopes. If you're looking for something that's just a really good scope for the price, then you should probably be looking at reflector telescopes. They do have some downsides though. Because the front of the scope is often open, that means you have what's called an open optical tube. It means that the mirrors inside is susceptible to dust and things like that. And that means that it increases maintenance. So sometimes you might have to go and clean those mirrors. And the other downside of these type of scopes is that they need what's called collimation where the mirrors need sometimes to be aligned simply because they can get slightly misaligned if it's if it's handled as it's moved around and if these mirrors get misaligned your picture is not going to be like spot on super sharp as you want them to don't be afraid though of this collimation process uh, it might sound scary having to precision align mirrors inside your telescope but there are relatively cheap aids you can buy that you just plug into the scope and you look at it and you get a little dot and you center it at the um, at a little like uh, uh, circle and, and you're done. There's a few screws at the back you need to, uh, to, uh, to adjust. It might seem dangerous, it might seem scary for a beginner, but I wouldn't worry too much about it. When you have done this a few times, you could do a collimation in 10, 15 minutes. As I mentioned in the beginning, there are different types of reflectors. The most common one is what's called the Newtonian. This is again where you have the main mirror at the back, secondary mirror at the front and then send the light out through the side. But we also sometimes see what's called a Dobsonian. These are very, very large telescope. Often you get a lot of aperture. Um, and these are often really good if you want to go for like a garden scope. If it's something you're not planning to take with you, pack up and move, then a Dobsonian, you get an amazing scope for a very affordable price. 
if you're planning to maybe take it out, if you're going out of the city or something like that, I would recommend something like a Newtonian. It's a really good beginner scope. And as when we're going to begin to talk about um, uh, mount here in a bit, you also see that there's some really good upgrade paths where you use this type of telescope. The last type of telescope is called a Cassegrain, or sometimes referred to as a hybrid or a compound scope. As you can probably guess from the name, these types of telescopes uses both lenses and mirrors to gain their magnification. These types of telescopes are constructed with a thin lens at the front. This is called a corrector lens or corrector plate. I've seen it being referred to sometimes where this is just basically correcting for small like optical imperfections in the rest of the scope. This means this lens doesn't give any magnification. It's merely there for correcting purposes. And that also means you can keep the lens relatively thin and light, allowing you to make them bigger. So you don't have to have that massive thick piece of glass as we do with refractors. At the back of the scope, you will have a main mirror and then all the way at the back of the, on the front of the scope again, you will then have your secondary mirror. And then often that light from the secondary mirror will be sent back in through a hole in the center hole in the main mirror to the um, to all your optics, um, all your cameras at the at the back of the scope. Because this is a closed tube design, because we have that corrector lens at the front, that means we are dealing with a closed loop or closed tube, and that means there are less maintenance. That main mirror at the back still needs collimation. So you're not gonna get rid of that, but there are less maintenance because you're dealing with a closed tube. Now the big downside of these scopes is price. They are expensive. You're gonna pay for these if you want one. It is my preferred type for me, um, because for me, I kind of feel like I get the best of both worlds. I get lower maintenance than I do with a open tube um, uh, Newtonian, for instance, and I still get that larger aperture that I um, that I can't really get on a refractor. But again, as I said, you're gonna have to pay for it if you want a scope like this. Finally, I just want to plug my book. This is the Cosmic Field Guide that I'm selling over on deepspacebook.com. If you want more information about different scope types and which type of uh, astrophotography they're good at, there are sections inside the book where I talk about the, um, the optical layout of them and what type of observations they are good at. And there are also some of the points that I've made in this video. It's also listed in this book. Check it out, deepspacebooks.com. Now, hopefully now you have an idea about what type of optical setup you want for your telescope. But you also need to mount it to something. You can't just shoulder mount it. There are two types of mounts. One's called altathimuths, and the other one is called equatorial mounts. Now, the altathimuth is essentially just a fork that the telescope is mounted in. It's a very simple design and therefore often also cheaper. But if you want any kind of tracking with these kind of mounts, you need to have some kind of computer hooked up to it. Sometimes they come like you can get small hand computers with them, so you don't have to have like a laptop, but you just have a basically like a remote that you can sit and dial in what you wanted, and then it will calculate all the tracking. But you do need some kind of computation in order to figure out how this telescope is going to track. One of the downsides with this type of mount is that they often come with the scope and that it is not user replaceable. That means that this is often where you get the entire package in one. Um, that means that you have scope and mount and you can't really just say, hey, I want a new scope and just replace it into the mount because if it's different diameter with the forks and it doesn't fit, stuff like that. So the upgrade path for these is not ideal, to be honest. The alignment process, personally, I find that to be relatively simple if you do go for tracking, as the computer will do most of it for you. It will basically tell you to put the telescope in a certain position, and then it will try to go to a star, you fine tune it, it will go to another star, you fine tune it, and then you're done. So the alignment process here is relatively straightforward, and the computer will do most of the work for you. The other type of mount, as I said, is what's called an equatorial mount. This type of mount is mounted at an angle in such a way that the rotation axis that the mount rotates around is pointed at um, Polaris or the North Star or actually the center that's right next to Polaris, but approximately towards the North Star. As you can imagine, that means that the alignment process is a much more manual thing where you have to sit and make sure this is perfectly aligned and everything is, um, is nice and neat before you start your observations. The benefit with these, of course, is that it makes the tracking a lot more simple, right? You just need, once that's aligned, you basically just need to turn that one axis once every 24 hours and you should have perfect tracking. Now, when you mount your optical tube to an equatorial mount, you're gonna mount it slightly off center and then you're gonna need counterweights on the other side and those counterweights, well, they add weight. <laughs> so that means this type of mount is often heavier 
Um, and as you can probably imagine, there is also a lot more um, stuff that is required by you to balance this correctly. Everything needs to be perfectly balanced. But just as with the collimation, this is a process that you will learn. And once you've done it a few times, this is going to become second nature to you. But the big benefit, and actually the reason why I would recommend that you get an equatorial mount, is the upgrade path. Because if you get an equatorial mount, it's very easy to replace the optical tube later. So if you decide down the line, hey, I want a bigger scope, I want a different type of scope, maybe you had a reflector and now you want a refractor or whatever, it's very, very easy to just replace that optical tube with something else. And that upgrade path means that it is what I would recommend for newer people. Um, even though it is a little bit more complicated, it requires a bit more from you as a user, I still think because of the upgrade path, if you want to get into this hobby, then um, that is my recommendation. Now, other than just the telescope and mount type, there are a few other things that you might want to consider, you might want to go for, or you might not, depending on your budget and your situation. When you look at the mount, or if you buy a scope with it as an entire package, you will often see it that it either has fully manual, push to or go to. Now, this refers to how automated the telescope or the mount is. Fully manual kind of explains itself. That means there's no electronics. You do all the things, you turn the knobs, and it also means if you want to do any kind of tracking, well, you can't really do it with that mount. You're going to have to manually sit and turn the, um, um, the telescope. If you have what's called push to, that often means you're going to be using like a phone or something similar, tablet maybe, that you're going to basically set mount on the telescope itself. That's going to be a star map, and you can then search and say, hey, I want to look at the Pleiades, and then the screen is going to point you to what direction you need to turn the telescope in order to find that specific object. You're still going to have to do all the turning yourself. There's still a manual process. That means there's no tracking, but it can help you find your way around the night sky if you're not too familiar with it. Go to is the full solution where you basically go into the hand computer or, or to a laptop and say, go to that object and the telescope goes, yes, sir. And it begins to what's called slew, which means just turns itself towards that object. And then when it hits that object, it will automatically track it across the night sky. So obviously, if you're doing any kind of astrophotography, especially if you want to do deep space or deep sky astrophotography, where you are taking really long exposures, having something with actual tracking on is a must. The other thing to consider is the focal length of your telescope. The focal length is essentially how much magnification you get. And you might think the more magnification, the better, but that's not the case. A lot of objects that you want to look at is not really, it's not really a problem how small they are. A lot of the objects are actually really large in the night sky. They're just way too faint for us to see. That means that aperture is a lot more important than focal length. Aperture, again, being how big the opening at the front of the telescope is. The bigger that opening is, the more light you can collect. So I would say get as much aperture, as much a big of an opening at the front of the telescope as you can within your budget and within your, uh, with other like practical um, limitations you may have in terms of transportation, storage, all that kind of stuff. When it comes to the focal length, I recommend that you go for a, a telescope with around a thousand millimeters of focal length. With this, if you decide to just mount a camera directly to it, you should have a pretty decent framing for a lot of the popular um, targets in the night sky, like the Andromeda Galaxy, the Orion Nebula, and the Pleiades. All of these objects are framed very nicely on a 1000 millimeter telescope. And if you in the future decide to go and get a, um, or want to go and look at smaller objects, you can get what's called a Barlow lens. These kind of lenses is just an extra lens you put in between the scope and your camera, and it effectively increases your magnification. It can be from a slight increase to maybe doubling it, giving you a lot more magnification. You can look at much smaller objects. These are relatively cheap um, compared to a lot of the other equipment. You can get them for like, a decent one for like $50, $50, something like that. So they're not too expensive. And, and again, it just means that you can get a little bit more life out of your scope if you want to look at smaller objects. I hope this video has helped you, but if you have more questions, I really recommend that you come by the community Discord server. There's a link for it in the description below this video, 
Over there, we have a bunch of people that are experts in both astrophotography, just astronomy or cameras, or all that stuff. It's a really friendly community for new people. So if you have questions, come by, ask all the questions. And I'm sure there are people over there who can, uh, who can help you answer your questions and help you make the decision for what you should buy as your first telescope. Thanks a lot for watching. It's a beauty. Eight inch with like dramatic corrections and everything. Everything was set up and properly aligned. I was ready to begin collecting light. However, this was when I realized that I made a critical mistake. 